Um, so to yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Uh, so go ahead. so yeah. today I, I will be talking about like a collection of 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 topics I've been interested in in the past couple of years, and they all revolve about um, a gene expression and how we can uh, study those using agent-based models in growing and dividing cell populations. So with the growing and dividing cell population, it typically associates something like a lineage tree that you can see here shaded in, in the background. So the basic setup we consider typically is where um, we have a kind of an isogenic cell population. Do you see my cursor? Mm, let I, me see. Oh, uh, yeah, we can see it. Okay, perfect. Mm -hmm. um, where, where you basically think of uh, a petri dish where you start with, with a single uh, bacterium and then you let these cells um, grow and divide and you end up with, with, a, with a clone population like the one down here. Uh -huh. So typically in quantitative analysis, what is done is that there's a, taking an image of those cells and the, in one of those um, using single molecule fish, I show you here on, on the right, so the single molecule fish in E. coli. And what you see here is that um, there are bright red spots of red fluorescence and so these are individual molecules in, in those cells. So what you ob observe in these type of snapshots is that mm -hmm. there are very two characteristic features. So there's variability in the number of these spots. So this, this is amount to uh, the variability in gene expression due to low molecule numbers. Um, so, but there's also another type of variability that becomes very apparent now from if you look at the outline of those cells, and this is the variability in the cell age and cell size. For example, if you, if you look here at those cells, um, you see that those cells just have divided. Basically, you see this black outline here, you having the cells, they are closely connected. In, and here you see like a septum, and they're basically partitioning the molecules between the two. But there are also other cells like those ones here that are just about to divide and everything in between. So there's a huge variability, not only in the in the, the expression of these molecules, but there's also variability in the in the in the cell age, whether you are you just have divided or you're just about to divide, and also the cell size. <clears throat> and so this is this type of um, features that I'm going to talk about uh, today. So the, the standard way of modeling gene expression is that you actually uh, generate samples from a continuous time Markov chain. So the standard way to do this is the is the Gillespie algorithm. And so the output of this algorithm is um is a, a trajectory that describes the number of molecules and in our interpretation in a cell now. Okay. So uh, in this uh, so in the simple uh, example, what you see is that in the beginning. Here you have some sort of production events of those molecules, but at some times degradation kicks in, and then these these uh, uh, time courses go down, up and down again. And this continues basically um, for, for a very long time. But you see that there's uh, for a small number of molecules, there's a significant variation in the, in those sample paths. Um, <clears throat> what what you can do now is that you if you take one of these um, uh, trajectories, you can perform a histogram over that. And mm -hmm. so this type of uh, model that, that I use here um, is um, a transcription mm -hmm. translation model where you have mRNA is just being produced and degraded. And from this mRNA, a protein um, is, is, is produced. So, and so this, what I, what I just showed you here is that you, if you take an average over this kind of uh, a trace and you look at the distribution, then, um, you could basically from this Gillespie algorithm obtain the statistics that you see in such a snapshot. And this the, the, the principle that allows us to do this is called ergodicity. So the way to describe this distribution um, in the literature has been uh, the chemical master equation also introduced mainly by Van Kamp and by Gillespie. And so this is the this kind of the state of the art in, in, in describing these systems mathematically. And so you can write down these equations for any type of reaction networks that are of, of the of these type of forms. So the very generic reactions where you have n reactants um, and n uh, products. 
And so then the time evolution equation, also most of you hopefully will be familiar with this, this, uh, this type of uh, linear equation for the uh, or li linear ODE for the, for the probability distribution of the stochastic process. In particular, it gives you the probability of observing um, in our interpretation a cell with a certain uh, number of molecules. And so to parameterize this equation, you only need to know the stoichiometry of your reaction network and the propensities in those cells. So the bad news is that even though this equation is, is kind of a linear ODE, so typically there are infinitely many uh, equations because the state space, if you look at the number of molecules is typically infinite. Mm. So this type of equation can only be solved in very um, in special cases. Um, um, the good news is that uh, the simple gene expression model that I've just talked about is, is one of them. And so this, this has been uh, studied in a number of, of um, uh, publications. And so, so in, in like about 10 years ago, Bokes actually um, mm -hmm. obtained like a, a full solution of this model in, in steady state conditions. So, so in, some, in some conditions, this is actually uh, possible. So for most of the talk, I will only talk about this very, very um, uh, sim simple model. So, so, um, but, but I hope that uh, most of these principles um, will also apply for for very complicated uh, gene regulatory networks that, that that could not be solved analytically. Okay. Um, so, so in in the, in the very early days of gene expression, um, so when when people actually looked into 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 cell and and looked into fluorescence of um, uh, reporters they actually found that this kind of picture that I just presented was actually not true and in the sense that um that uh, there, there's additional noise and this could be visualized by this type of two color experiment a set of beautiful experiments um done by um uh, Edowitz and then um, Peter Swain in the lab of, of, uh, of Siegel. So um, uh, what you basically could think of that you put like a, a two identical circuits with, with different colors um, into the same cell and you now observe the expression. So there are two hypothetical scenarios what could happen. So one is A, that these two reporters, they do exactly the same. So they might look noisy, but as you look, Follow these uh, expression levels over time. They are exactly doing the same. So here, these two colors of uh, mm. green and red. So what you were actually would observe is a mixture of these two. So your cell population, even though you had heterogeneity over time, would look completely homogeneous in this case. Uh -huh. It's just yellow. The other kind of completely opposite scenarios that they they are completely random and both do different things. And so in this case, you would observe this heterogeneity also in a snapshot. In this sense, you would have um, all these um, mm -hmm. different colors that you observe mm -hmm. in the cell. So you have some cells that are, are red, you have some cells that are green, and everything in between. Um, so in reality, um, it depends. So it, it might depend on actually um, the expression level of these um, uh, genes. So what, what they found in the experiment, so this was an inducible uh, promoter, that at low molecule numbers, you actually got the, 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 um, the scenario where everything is random. So it's very much a scenario where everything is caused only by intrinsic noise. Um, but at very high kind of expression levels, they found that, that the, the other scenario uh, was true, where the population looks more um, homogeneous. So um, to incorporate this type of aspects into models, people have used um, like extrinsic noise sources. So basically what they have done is they, they uh, simulate a model of gene expression, uh, like in this time course here that I've already showed you. But now that they um, uh, kind of assume that your parameters, for instance, the transcription rate would be drawn from some sort of distribution, which doesn't change over time. Mm -hmm. And so when you do this for another cell, now this kind of transcription rate might, this cell might have a different transcription rate. And so it would lead generally to a higher expression level. And so if you do, if you continue doing this and you look at the snapshot distribution, you would see some sort of mixture of all these different um, transcription levels. So this type of modelings has been, for me personally, uh, a bit um, unsatisfying for two mm -hmm. reasons. Mm -hmm. First of all, they are very difficult to parameterize because most of the variability 
that you put into the model say it is not directly observable and um, and is, is not accessible from first principles. Um, and the second aspect is that in these type of models, you, you have to give up one important principle, and this is the ergodicity. Namely, if you take a, an average over a single cell over time, this will not have the same distribution as in the snapshot. Okay. Um, so the main reason um, that I want to propose in this talk um, is that the, the the chemical mass equation, as I have written down um, in on the previous slides, does not apply to growing and dividing cells. And so the, the reason for this is that actually cells do not divide in the mass equation. And there's also typically only uh, the talks about the re one realization. So it only talks about one cell. And as I just argued, it's difficult to separate uh, in, this, in, 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 in this type of uh, frameworks different sources of variability, namely those from cell physiology, age and size, from those that come actually from gene expression. And so the, the first question that I want to address is how to model um, uh, gene expression in growing and dividing cells from first principles. And so if we would achieve this, um, I, I aim to, to have different descriptions, namely that we uh, gain understanding into how to model isolated cells, like in different uh, devices. So this is here uh, a mother machine, oh, oh, oh. Is, um, um, and a microfluidic device where you capture like a single E. coli cell that, you, that can be tracked over many uh, divisions. But also you could think that you grow cells on, on maybe on, on, on a pad and you actually visualize the whole lineage trees of cells. And then uh, the, the final outcome would be like a snapshot of the population that would be more appropriate for like a high throughput experiments. So ideally we want to develop a theory that, that can basically capture all these different type of um, experimental devices. And then the other question that I want to address is, is how do extrinsic noise arises um, uh, in these models? And then how we can co construct like accurate, effective noise models that include all these effects of extrinsic noise, um, namely those of these fluctuating rate constants. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's start. So, um, so the, the main framework that, that I will be using are agent-based models. Mm -hmm. And so here, so typically agent-based models have been used to describe um, agent as uh, the, the molecules in the cell. So here my agents are actually the cells. And so each cell in them has like a, a kind of inbuilt reaction network that um, describes the stochastic gene expression. So, and what I also include is the partitioning of molecules at cell division. So here, which if you follow like a single ancestor uh, mm -hmm. from birth to division, then at division, the, the molecules are basically partitioned between two daughter cells. Mm -hmm. And so if you keep on iterating this type of uh, model over many divisions, what you, what you also need to uh, include is kind of a variability in the division timings, because now two cells will divide exactly at the same uh, time. So yes. if you keep on, on doing this, what you what you will obtain is some sort of snapshot, and the snapshot you could compare to 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 experiments here that I've shown oh. you in, in in the beginning. And so this um, so for, for this type of snapshot distributions, we can now ask using these models if we can find like a, a single cell trajectory that has the same distribution as the snapshot. Mm -hmm. So um, as, as Jay uh, has mentioned, he is working also on, on agent-based models in, in spatial contexts, right? So in my, my, my models are completely uh, well mixed. Wow. Okay, so so what we have de derived um, is from it like a, um, a branching um, process theory is um, how how the type of snapshot density here, which is the number of cells uh, with a certain age and a certain um, uh, amount of molecules in those cells evolves over time. And so so the basic result is that the the time evolution these quantities of the um, has different contributions, some that come from the 
division from the birth of these cells and some that come from the reactions. So I'm going now through these individual contributions. So the division part here um, occurs with the with the rate um, that is typically dependent in our models on, on the age of those cells. The birth contribution just um, is proportional to the number of dividing cells. So this is the um, the division rate times the number of cells at that age. Then there exists a partition kernel, which I call here B, which is just the probability that a cell with X prime uh, molecules has a daughter of um, with X molecules. So if you visualize this, um, if, if, if you keep on um, producing molecules, it might end up here, and then with some probability produce a cell with X molecule over here, or another cell with, with this X, uh, with, with it, it, um, so you're basically producing a, a cell with X molecules and one with X prime minus X, mm -hmm. right? And there's also kind of here a delta function because at, at cell birth, the age is basically set to zero and obviously a factor of two because you produce two cells. Mm -hmm. So the reaction term is actually exactly the same as in the traditional chemical master equation. So you can see this type of equation as an, as an extension, right? That includes also effects of birth and division. So using this framework, we we have analyzed different statistics. So the first statistic that I want to put forward is that is this type of forward lineage, and this corresponds basically to an isolated cell tracked over many divisions. Um, so in 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 theory, how we construct this type of um, statistic is that we take a lineage tree and we we start from the ancestor of the population. And then with equal probability, we follow um, in this lineage tree one of these two daughter cells down, down the tree. So in this case, so if, you, if you do this with probability one half, you end up with such a lineage. So the interesting thing is that if you construct such a lineage, and so that would basically correspond to this type of mother machine experiment, then this is lineage has a very different distribution than uh, snapshot distribution. So we here just did this via uh, uh, simulations and so the, I have what, a question yes please so what what does the snapshot distribution mean is it a uh, distribution of the molecules in entire cell population or only a single cell so so the, the snapshot would be basically taking um the distribution across the cells at the end point I see and so the the uh, forward lineage would be the distribution of the, the cells as you follow them over time in this way that I here described, where you basically follow each daughter with equal probability. I gotcha, thank you. Yeah, and so this was quite striking to us because it means basically that uh, those lineages do not represent typical cells in the population. So it turns out that obviously that is this kind of forward lineage is not the only way how you can construct a lineage or the cell trajectory. Um, another way would be that you actually pick a cell of your final population and you follow it backwards in time. Basically, you track the ancestors of this cell. Right? Um, so when you do that, uh, it basically amounts as if you do a time-lapse movie experiment and you play the movie backwards. So if you do that and you track the number of molecules in that backward lineage, what you see is that this is actually much closer uh, to the snapshot distribution. However, this is not, not quite uh, the same still. So our, our result that we obtained um, um, mathematically is that if, if you look at the population snapshot now, and you perform like an operation that is, is akin to like a conditional distribution. So you look at the probability of observing a certain number of molecules in a cell at a given age. So what I call here the age sorted population. So then a uh, typical trajectory that you would obtain is for the molecule numbers on average for young cells, they might be low and for older cells, they might go up, right? So if you look at this type of distribution, then this actually, um, a, this age-sorted population has exactly the same distribution 
in a snapshot as in a backward lineage, mm -hmm. but it doesn't agree with the forward lineage. Mm -hmm. So this kind of agreement of, of this backward lineage with the snapshot gives us kind of a new interpretation of snapshot data. And so this interpretation is that the heterogeneity that you observe in such a snapshot right, so, so can, can be replaced by uh, looking at the histories of single cells over time. So this basically is a very generic uh, um, principle uh, that connects um, gene expression fluctuations um, with a sample path of, 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 of growing and dividing cells. So the intuition um, why this um, these two, um, so the, the history statistics and the forward lineage actually disagree, um, can be seen in the following way, that if you pick a lineage in using this forward statistic, the probability that you uh, pick any of these forward lineages mm -hmm. actually is two to the power of minus D, where D is the number of cell divisions. So the kind of the probability that you choose any lineage decreases exponentially with the number of cell divisions in that lineage. So that means that you, the typical lineage that you would pick has a low number of cell divisions. However, in, in history, the probability of picking such a lineage is just one over the population size. So one over the, the total number of cells. So they have a very different type of probability. So in, uh, so in effect, in, in histories, fast growing cells will be open, overrepresented. And which means generally that forward lineages are not very common. So we tested this on fluorescence data um, from the lab of Bakamoto. So they just simply expressed a, a GFP molecules in growing and dividing E. coli cells. And so what we what we did here is that we compared these kind of backward statistics by picking random uh, lineages and, and obtaining the fluorescence at cell birth with the um, with the age sort of population, which is basically just uh, the um, uh, the distribution across the snapshot. What you see here that this um, agrees very well. Another useful aspect of this principle is that it actually allows us um, to mm. obtain analytical analytical solutions to mm -hmm. um, snapshot distributions. Mm -hmm. And so, in this simple in this simple model here, I look at this mRNA. Um, uh, protein expression uh, um, model, and mm -hmm. so what we what we have done is that we um, uh, could solve this analytically for any type of division distribution. What you see here is that if we compare the the, the simulations of, of of histories with this type of age stored population uh, predictions, this agrees exactly. So this is kind of an exact solution. So um, it also allows us to understand more why. Uh, snapshots um, distributions are actually different. Um, namely, now we can analyze, uh, we we can give dynamical interpretations to these um, fluctuations observed in snapshots. And for for example, here for this type of simple model, that if you look at the forward lineage and you look just look at the samples from a single uh, tree, is what you see is that the forward lineages they generally have higher expression levels uh, compared to histories. And so the reason for this is that in these histories, you're typically picking cells that divide very frequently. And so this frequently uh, frequent division leads to dilution, which generally leads to lower expression levels than in lineages where those cells divide very infrequently. See. Sorry, so let me let me uh, interrupt yeah. a little bit. <clears throat> so what does history mean in this in this slide? So this is the backward lineage. So this history means that, that um, so at the, at the final time point, yeah, here, so this is basically um, realizations of a lineage tree. You just pick a random cell, okay, and you follow, follow it backward in time. While in this in this lineage statistics, what I have done is that I, I start with a single ancestor and I follow it forward in time. Uh, so history is a backward and lineage is forward time. Exactly, yes. Yes. Uh, so I don't follow why the backward time has lower uh, the protein copy numbers and more frequent division. That's so, I mean, so, yeah. so the frequency of, of the division follows basically from this argument that in forward lineages, right? Um, yep. The 
um, the probability to pick one depends on the number of cell divisions in that lineage. And so this, um, so if, if you pick any type of lineage uh, in, in a tree, uh, the probability of picking that lineage decreases exponentially with the number of cell divisions. So mm -hmm. which that means you forward lineages will, will always be very short. Okay, <laughs> so have very few cell divisions. While in the history uh, probabilities, um, the, you, you're just weighting each lineage equally, independent okay, of the okay. number of cell divisions. Okay, okay, thank you. Does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> yeah. And so, so, so this effect has has a di direct um, relation to the gene expression level because the, the, the cell divisions actually sets the dilution rate, which is then uh, differs between um, the the forward and the backward count. Thing. And so this this difference you can also see then. Um, so, so so the nice thing is that we now have this type of history interpretation of of of, of cell um, histories. That that can be connected with with the snapshot distributions to explain why in the snapshot you also see this kind of this decreased um, expression levels. Okay. So the the interesting thing is now that um, uh, so these differences are somehow set by the um, cell cycle variability, and so in this is in this simple model what we found is that um, the expression of that protein. Um, actually has different sensitivity to the noise in the cell cycle in these different measures. So for example, in this forward lineage, uh, the amine expression level is increasing uh, with the cell cycle fluctuation, while in the snapshots it's actually decreasing. So that's uh, the type of uh, phenomenon I, I just showed you on the, on the sample part. So another way th uh, that um, we could, uh, that we exploited these models is that um, now that we have um, agent-based representation of a cell, is that we can place two reaction networks in the same cell. So this is akin to this two-color experiments by Alois that I have described you earlier. So here, basically, you look at, at the cell, and we, we assume that there might be um, a, a green fluorescent protein, which we call here reporter one. There might be a red fluorescent protein reporter two, and we now go through this process of uh, growth and division where these molecules are continuously expressed. And so what we expect now is that um, there would be two types of noise sources, one that are the uncorrelated noise that comes only from the reactions in the cells because these two uh, gene circuits that actually don't talk to each other. Um, but there might be also extrinsic noise sources, and this comes from the fact that cells are actually um, uh, dividing with a type of stochastic um, uh, division rate. Okay, so um, so the operational definition that was actually used in those experiments um, has been in the way that you, if you take the difference between these two reporters, Mm -hmm. And you, you you look at this this type of variation, so the variation between these two reporters, then this is proportional to the the intrinsic variance. Mm -hmm. and then you can look at the correlations to the reporters. So what so what are the um, the the similarities between the, the reporters? And this gives you this extrinsic variance. So if you sum these two, if you sum these two contribution up, then this gives you the total uh, noise um, uh, of of each reporter. So. Uh, so we have done this um, in in a kind of closed form. So you can derive like the pool of matrix equations similar to the the linear noise approximation that we have used here for the intrinsic and extrinsic components. I don't want you to to go through all of these formulas, but what I want to highlight is that there are certain now um, these these uh, kind of uh, matrix equations they have to be supplemented with boundary conditions, and these boundary conditions account for cell divisions. And so there are different sources in these boundary conditions. So some sources of intrinsic noise are the partitioning of molecules and the randomness in the, in the reactions. So as you would expect, but there are also these extrinsic noise sources and they, they come from the cell cycle noise. And so we have used this type of um, noise decomposition to um, look at these intrinsic and extrinsic noise components. And what we found is not, not that only the means are affected by these um, by by these um, uh, different statistics that you 
of terms are either these these four lineages compared to the model machine that is snapshot statistics, but also these uh, intrinsic and extrinsic noise components both depend on these division uh, mm -hmm. time fluctuations and potentially have different sensitivities as mm -hmm. these is shown here for the intrinsic noise. I see. So the nice thing is now that you can also apply the same principles to more complicated gene expression uh, models. And the one that I show you here is one where you have a protein being expressed and then you add negative feedback, namely that the protein binds to its promoter and represses uh, its own expression. So mm -hmm. kind of negative autoregulation. So what we then can do is that we, 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 we do simulations and our analytical approximations now. So the, as you might know that the mass equation for this type of um, bimolecular reactions cannot be solved um, exactly. So in this case, we need to resort to approximations. And so what you see is that our approximations still uh, hold quite well for the population snapshots, um, but are only approximate. And so what we have analyzed here is that it, uh, there's the intrinsic noise components in these circuits basically has a minimum. So this is a, a common motif that is used for noise repression in cells. Mm -hmm. um, and what so what we found is that the location of this minimum varies uh, between these different statistics. So whether you look at the, the noise minimum across the snapshot, and the forward lineages um, will have different minima. So that's what you basically can see here, where, for instance, the yellow line has a minima here at K uh, over uh, 400, and the other one at around half that value. So the interesting uh, thing now is that these noise minimizations now they depend on the cell cycle fluctuations. So this is here the, the X axis. And so if, if you look at the optimal feedback strength that reduces these uh, intrinsic noise components, what you see is that in, to achieve noise minimization, you need to increase feedback in a population, while in isolated cells, like in these four mm -hmm. lineages, you actually need to decrease this type of feedback. Mm -hmm. So this is gives us an interesting perspective on optimality. So it really depends on uh, what type of experiments we are doing, whether we are doing um, experiments with cell populations or with, with single cells, or what, um, what type of uh, evolutionary speaking, what type of objectives um, evolution might have to achieve this type of minimization? Okay, so to 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 come to to the last part of, of my talk, I want to um, basically talk about how we can produce uh, effective models, and so this is joint work with with Vahid Charasai in 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 in, in at, also a colleague at Imperial Mathematics. And so, so what we were interested in is how gene expression actually depends now on cell physiology in terms of cell size. So what is known very well is in, so these are mammalian cells here, is that the expression of certain mRNAs in cells actually kind of scales with the size of these cells. So if you have a larger cell, you will expect that those cells express more molecules um, than the small cells. So this is here a single molecule fish data. And what you see is the, is the expected number of um, mRNA in, for a cell in a certain, uh, of a certain right. size. Okay, so, and so the, this is kind of the, the mean level that um, I think was roughly um, un understood and I will give you an argument how we can un understand this, but I would also want to tell you how gene expression noise now depends on cell size. Mm -hmm. So the simple way we can understand the mean dependence that I presented on, on the past slide is that you basically write down and and. ODE for the number of molecules in a cell. So this is all deterministic. So here you would basically write down the, the, the time derivative of your um, uh, of the number of the level of gene expression, for instance, would, would follow this ODE uh, with rate of change f of x. So if you also add now a, a separate equation for, for cell size, basically the, the, the change in cell size would be alpha times s. So this amounts to exponential growth. As I just mm -hmm. show here on, on the left, then uh, if you if you divide um, this number of molecules by s, you can um, look at some sort of concentration variable, and so this concentration would be constant oh. if your 
from if your reaction rates would be extensive. So we have this particular condition here on these um, reactions. Okay. So this um, kind of, if you iterate this um, over reactions, that then over certain divisions, then what you would see is that usually your molecule numbers uh, would go up and the division they're halved, and uh, but still your concentrations would be constant. So if you now want to um, obtain an effective stochastic model of these um, effects, what you would, would do potentially is, is, is very similar. You would write down that the type of molecules is, is a product of the cell size and the concentrations uh, of these molecules in, in those cells. So this is quite an interesting idea because then then there would be kind of oh, you could see this this s as some sort of uh, extrinsic noise mm -hmm. uh, um, that um, multiplies your concentrations and the 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 noise in those concentrations would be the intrinsic noise and so you could characterize this model by joint distribution which would be the joint distribution of the number of molecules and the cell size. Um. To, to put this into a master equation model, so there are, there are various approaches. So what I'm uh, uh, using here is some sort of effective dilution model or what I would call like an extrinsic noise model. So in these effective dilution models, you, you would consider any type of reaction networks. And then you assume that there exist effective dilution reactions so that dilute every single um, uh, molecule in your cell. So they do that with, with, with a single uh, rate, which corresponds basically to the division rate or the growth rate of your cell. So you would basically add these um, additional degradation reactions. So now if you also had um, size variability, you could think that um, this reaction kinetics would be somehow coupled to cell size. And so in, in this kind of extrinsic noise model, the cell size would be okay. stochastic parameters that would be fixed for each cell. So over time, you you would have this type of constant cell size for each cell, but across the population, you would have this variability. And then you can simulate these type of effective um, master equations using a Gillespie algorithm, and then look at these snapshot distributions. And so to obtain these snapshot distributions analytically, you can use the, the kind of chemical mass equation. And so what we were interested in is how these type of extrinsic noise models, so the ones where cell size is modeled, modeled kind of statically, where it's drawn from the distributions, compare now with the agent-based models where cells actually have a certain size and they divide, um, they, they also divide in, in, in two cells. And cell size actually, as you as you see here, inc increases exponentially also between divisions. So in this in these type of models, what you obviously have is that all these cells are not uh, are, are not independent as in this type of model. So we were wondering whether this extrinsic noise model was a good approximation for these agent based models. And so we derived um, a kind of a, a more rigorous statement here. Uh -huh. And this is that these extrinsic noise models uh, agree exactly with the agent-based models if these models exhibit a certain property that we call stochastic concentration homeostasis. Uh -huh. And so this con uh, uh, stochastic concentration homeostasis is kind of a generalization of what I just told you, where I said that um, the uh, the number of molecules would be a product of cell size and concentration. So this cannot mm -hmm. hold for um, mm -hmm. this cannot hold for molecule numbers, right? Because they're discrete, so that, that wouldn't work out. But there's an analog where you say that um, this it's it still holds. So basically, it's a product of cell size, but uh, the number of molecules correspond to uh, a Poisson variable with with that. Okay. So that means actually that your um, uh, distribution mm -hmm. um, is essentially a mixture of Poisson distribution where this uh, stochastic concentration doesn't depend on cell size. Hence, we call it concentration in homeostasis. And so this is kind of a, a very powerful um, 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 criterion or, or method of, of model reduction because it allows us to, to provide exact analytical solutions um, 
by simply in, uh, solving the corresponding mass equation model. So for example, here I'm looking at um, a switching gene that basically can have a promoter in an off or an on state and the um, transcription rate of, of, of this gene uh, scales with the cell size. So it's simply proportional to, to, to cell size. So simply um, what, what I would have shown you here uh, in, in the previous slide where the mRNA concentration would, um, would be constant. So in this type of model, you can see that this um, extrinsic noise model here by given by these um, solid lines mm -hmm. uh, for different positions in the cell cycle agrees very well with the with the agent based simulations that are given by the mm -hmm. areas. So in this in this model, you can give an analytic expression um, for for this stochastic concentration. So in this case, it's kappa. Um, it follows a beta distribution. For more more complicated models, so here in in case where you also add uh, stochastic bursts um, that are now where the burst size or the mean burst size scales with cell size, mm -hmm. so we're actually um, looking at some sort of an expression of a protein. Um, these kind of um, these type of stochastic concentrations can become doubly stochastic, so you can have more complicated models. So in this case, the, the concentration kappa. Um, is it follows a gamma distribution, but some of these parameters here then would be again stochastic, so you get more complicated uh, type of solutions. And again, what you see is that those solutions um, that correspond to the mass equations agree very well with the Asian based model. Mm -hmm. So um, there are other examples. So, for instance, this very simple example that I started with, where you have the translation rate actually. Uh, scales uh, with uh, um, so the transcription rate scales with cell size but the translation rate doesn't scale with cell size so here you would expect stochastic concentration in homeostasis for the mRNA levels but not for the protein and what you what I plot here is that they look at the CV squared as a function of the cell size and you see that these extrinsic noise models and the agent based models disagree completely right so the good news is that if you look at the marginal statistics, so you don't look at cells at a given cell size, these seem to agree approximately within, but well, not exactly, within a margin of like uh, about 5%. So to conclude my talk, um, and I hope I showed you that these agent-based models are quite useful to, to understand uh, gene expression uh, fluctuations in growing cells. And I also showed you um, an ergodic principle that allows you to provide a dynamic interpretation to snapshot data. And I introduced a new concept called stochastic concentration of homeostasis, which kind of generalizes the, the deterministic analog that can be used for exact model reduction in the presence of extrinsic noise. Um, yeah, so I'm, I here listed a couple of um, um, uh, papers that we have produced over the years. So if you uh, um, please feel free to to look this up, and if you have any questions, I'm, I'm happy to take them or, uh, also by, by email. Thank you. Oh yeah. Oh, thanks so much. Yeah, it's exciting work. Uh, so uh, it's a Q and A time. So please feel free to have a, a question.